I'm Michael Quinn Patton, uh, coming to you from northern Minnesota, joined tonight by Jeff Matthias from northern India, who will be presenting on Time is of the Essence here in a few moments. This is our fourth New Marvel webinar. And at the very first one, uh, Jeff actually, in a response to the presentation, suggested that we consider time as an important dimension in Blue Marble evaluation. And so uh, that began an exchange that we had, and he offered some uh, very intriguing and I found brilliant uh, ways of thinking about this. So for those who may be at the first webinar uh, in this series, let me do a quick recap. Um, what we're doing is creating a global community of people interested in new marble evaluation. Um, and uh, Jeff Bean in India certainly represents a part of that uh, global flavor. Um, and in tribute to uh, his Indian contribution, Mahatma Gandhi famously said, the future depends on what you do today. And that's the linkage between Blue Marble Evaluation and our future. Um, Blue Marble Evaluation involves a set of principles that include facing the realities of the Anthropocene, the period during which humans have been having a major impact on the global ecosystem. Um, a good bit of it running up against the limited resources of the earth. Um, we're taking a global perspective, looking across silos of programs, of SDGs, of issues, of national boundaries, uh, looking to connect the local and global, give a global, global perspective to local things and a local perspective to global considerations. And tonight, adding time being of the essence to these principles. So if you're um, joining us, we'd ask you to mute. We'll have a question and answer session in about 30 minutes. Uh, but Jeff, is, uh, if his internet connection holds, he says he's under a tree in uh, North India looking at the Himalayas. And uh, Jeff, let me invite you to, to join us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing yours. Thanks, uh, thanks, Michael. Um, this is all, all quite exciting. Um, let's see how we go here. Um, can everyone hear me? Oh, well, you, you, you're all muted. Yes. Okay, so I click, I click the, here, share button. Here. Um, the share button down the bottom, yeah? That's right. Okay. And, and coming up, and um, there you are. Great. Okay, and can you see my PowerPoint here? Yes. Cool. We're, okay. We're seeing it, not in presentation style right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing... Um, how do I do it? Uh, That's probably it. Yeah, yeah. okay, great. Okay, okay now we've seen your screen. 90 Perfect. minutes of football with, um, with me and Michael. Um, if you guys thought you were here for an, uh, um, an evaluation webinar, you're in the wrong place, so it's, it's football today. <laughs> um, and I can't, I can't, um, I can't, I've got to introduce myself. My, everyone knows Michael. I've got to introduce myself. Um, and... There, there we are, that's me and my four kids and my wife, who's an adventurer and a musician and a doctor and a poet and a linguist and all sorts of things. Um, this photo is a little bit old, um, but it's a photo of not exactly what we look no, like right now, but it's, it's a photo of who we are. Um, that's probably about the best introduction I can do of myself. Um, so I need a volunteer. Um, is there someone out there who wants to be a volunteer, you'll be on for about 30 seconds. Um, unmute your mic and stick your hand up and say, and introduce yourself. No volunteers, okay. Michael, I'm gonna, I'm gonna force you to be the volunteer here, Michael. Um, I'm you happy on? to do so, yep. Okay, so I, 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 I do a, um, I run an NGO that's, Brings, that's trying to bring the joy of football to the to the the kids of the world, and I've got this football here, um, Michael. I'd like you to evaluate this football. Is this a decent football for 
how would you evaluate it? Well, it's a little blurry on the, on the picture, yeah, but it looks like it's round. And um, it's what, uh, of course, the United States people would call a soccer ball. But in your part of the world and every place else, it's called a football. It looks quite good from here. What, um, what criteria would you use to evaluate it, Michael? Well, that it's round. And um, I can't tell if it's fully inflated or, or appropriately inflated. Um, but it, um, it looks like it's... Um, uh, appropriately round and uh, it can't because there's nothing to compare to I can't be sure of the size of it but I'm willing to assume that it is the correct size of a, a football okay um, and given that I run an NGO are you going to be worried about the cost of the football and the pressure that it's it's pumped up and all those kind of things yes for sure yeah yeah, you know, I, I, have to, I have to worry about my cost. Okay, so thank, thank, thanks for that, Michael. You're, you're, you're off now. Um, that was a great evaluation. But I, this football, I didn't ask you to evaluate a football. I asked you to evaluate this football. Um, and it can't be evaluated out of context. And time is part, time, um, I think time is part of the context of, of this football. And every football um, is on a trajectory, where it was, where it is, and where it's going. And that's critical. So here's a, here's a football here. And, the one that Michael just evaluated and it's a reasonable price and it's spherical and it's, it's a certain brand and it's cost, it's cost is okay and it's pressure is all right. But around this football, that's where it is right now. Who recognizes that? This is the, uh, a classic moment in football history. Um, 1986 World Cup uh, quarterfinal, Diego Maradona on the left, who's in many, including my opinion, the greatest player ever to play football. And on the right, the great English goalkeeper, Peter Shilton. And the ball's up there. It's 0-0 in the World Cup, second half of the World Cup semi uh, quarterfinal. And Diego Maradona quite clearly cheating. He's using his hand. Um, there it is there. Now, you can't evaluate that unless you know what happens after that and probably also what happened before it. But let's start with after. It's obviously critical um, where, uh, where this ball's going to go. And many of you will have seen this. This ball uh, goes over Shilton's head and lobs into the goal. Um, also critical what the referee saw. Maradona, being a football genius, knew exactly where the referee was and knew that 50,000 people in the stadium could see him, but the referee couldn't. Referee gave a goal, and once a goal's given, it can't be ungiven. So he got the goal 1-0 to Argentina, World Cup quarterfinal. Um, and where did it come from? Here's someone, that's, the circle shows um, the picture I just showed you, but Maradona had actually done done a, uh, several pieces of brilliance in order to get to that position. Um, and then he knocks the ball into the goal, goal, goal handball. Um, so that's a little trajectory. Um, and that single insta in instance um, in the red circle is meaningless unless you know the rest of this uh, trajectory. But it goes wider than that. Five minutes after this, Diego Maradona scored, I think probably the best goal of all time, at least the best goal in, in, in World Cup uh, history, um, with the same football, 2-0 um, to Argentina. Argentina goes on to win the World Cup quarterfinal. That's what happened in the future. Um, and went on to, to win the World Cup. And you could zoom out even a little bit further and say, where did all this come from? And this, this is, um, this is in, in the um, context of the Malvinas War, the Falklands War. And if any of you think that uh, football has nothing to do with the Malvinas War. This is what Diego Maradona said af um, after the game. We said football had nothing to do with the Malvinas War. But we knew they had killed a lot of Argentinian boys there, killed them like little birds, and this was revenge. And that, for me, if ever there is a, um, a statement that proves that the, co the comment that everything before the butt is bullshit, there it is. Um, he, he clearly, the, the Malvinas War was critical in that. Also, Argentina's dirty war, uh, at the time they were pushing people out of aeroplanes in the military dictatorship in, in Argent, Argentina. Um, and, um, yeah, he, he, he was a poor boy, poor boy from a, a, a village doing, um, do, um, in, the, in the middle of a, a right-wing dictatorship. Um, that whole football, that moment, um, was absolutely critical in a big, long trajectory. Where did it come from? And so I defi defined this word trajectory. 
the path over time of an object moving through space. Um, and I think there's a trajectory to every project as well. Um, and evaluation only has meaning in its context and time is always part of the context. Um, and every project has a trajectory. You, when you go and do an evaluation of a program or, or a project, you have to think about where it's come from, where it is and where it's going. Um, and the context has a trajectory too, the context in which that project is, is nested. And if we don't think about that stuff, we don't think about trajectory, I think we, um, we miss a lot of what's important in evaluation. And I'll tell you a couple of stories later on about that, but I'm now gonna go back to you, Michael. Thank you, Jeff. That's a tremendous uh, example and a memorable one. It takes me back. Um, and certainly um, the way in which sports is connected to politics is a part of uh, many stories. The end of apartheid, the sports connection internationally was important. Um, and we see these interconnections uh, all the time. So the 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 focus that we're bringing to to this uh, this webinar into Blue Marble is precisely trying to emphasize context um, in all its dimensions, cultural, political, economic, and you've beautifully given us the temporal context to take into account. Um, so I want to to have us all hear from you as much as possible. I know you've got some other things to, to uh, share with us. So uh, I'm gonna pass it back to you, Jeff. Here we go. Uh, sorry, have you got, can you can you hear me? Have you got my screen? Yep, yep, we yeah. got it. We see it. Okay, you're on. Okay. Cool. So we started with that. Evaluations only have have um, meaning meaning in the con uh, context, and we use that football an analogy. So here's a here's a couple of stories about that. Um, these guys, um, P and K S, who I did a midterm uh, review um, last year. Um, this is definitely a story that has a trajectory. Um, it has a trajectory from rural Cambodia where there's beautiful, I took this photo of this lotus flower right outside their project um, office in, in rural Cambodia. Um, and it's got a trajectory from there to here, which is on the way from Phnom Penh to their project office, the bridge across the, um, across the Mekong. And I kind of like this photo. It's hard and it's, it's got this kind of weird light and it's all about metal and tarmac and cars and a sultry sky. And there's not, nothing like the pink lotus in, in this. And this, <coughs> this story traverses that trajectory. Um, and on the other, so the side of the Mekong that we, um, one side's got lotus flowers, the other side's got these things, which are, this is a factory um, where women, usually women, there are some men also work from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., uh, 12 hours a day, they'll end up with one US dollar in their hand. Um, and if you ever wondered where all those cheap t-shirts that we get in, New Zealand and Australia and USA come from, it's from there. So here's, here's, the, here's how um, PNK cases, their project logic. This is rural community. So they've got a community which has got all sorts of different kind of people, people in it. Um, and they've got a vision for their community and it was, it was pre pretty, pretty standard vision about um, you know, kind of development and opportunities and equality. And, um, and they recognize that PNK, look, we're, we're very small. How could we, how could we possibly um, bring this vision into a, uh, um, to um, come to pass? They use something called outcome mapping, which looks at it this way. They say, let's put ourselves, that's, the, that's our area of interest. Um, and the green circle, that's our area of influence. And inside our area of influences, those, um, the commune council, the village leaders, the village development association, the school committees, and the community development association. And if we work with them, um, and that's the red arrows, that's our mission. We'll work with those guys. And we hope that, that they'll, um, the green arrows, they will change. They will change their, um, 
in outcome mapping, their outcomes are uh, their behavior, attitude, relationships, or policies. Um, they'll change how they behave. And if all those key, the key players simultaneously change, change their outcomes, um, then hopefully um, our vision will emer emerge like that. Not because of what we do, but because of how we work with, with other people. So that's logic. Um, here were my five evaluation questions. Have those groups at PN, PNKS worked? Have they really changed? Are the outcomes there? Um, is life better in the communities? What has PNKS contributed to that? Um, if PNKS leaves, would those guys still continue to behave the way they do? And then the fifth one was looking really internally at PNKS. Are they appropriately doing what they need to do in order to achieve this outcome mapping um, approach to work? Um, and so roughly, question one, question one is, um, are the green arrows there? Have, uh, have those guys changed? Question two is, um, has the PNKS vision, uh, vision emerged? Um, question three is, are the red arrows, PNKS's work, do those contribute to the, to the um, green arrows? Question four was, if the red arrows disappeared, would the green arrows um, continue to be there? Would those um, groups continue to behave in the way that we hope they would? And question five is internally about PNKS. So obviously I'm not gonna, I, I'll give you a link at the end of this to the full evaluation report, which PNKS is happy to share, but I'll go very quickly. Um, we did it via outcome harvesting, which is an evaluative technique, which kind of looks for changes of behavior, attitude, relationship, or policy. Um, first is who changed, and then asks why do they change, um, and what does it mean? Um, and this is what the work was like, going around sitting in village houses and getting fed, fed these amazing little snacks and talking to people like this. Um, and very quickly, other boundary partners, that's those five groups that PNK um, works with, are they changing? Are there outcomes there? And the answer was undoubtedly yes. Um, um, this is my translator, Somnang, and she's talking to a, um, a school, uh, school principal. Um, and question two was, because of those changes in the people P and Case works with, have other people changed in order to make life better? And this principal told us about how disadvantaged kids in the, were now being enrolled in a school and how that had been influenced by the Commune Council that, that P and Case had worked with, et cetera. So these are very broad answers to the question, but um, question two, we got a pretty good yes for. What has um, P and Case contributed to that? That's question three. Um, and again, really, really strong evidence of P and Case has contributed significantly to those changes of behavior, attitude, relationship, and policy. Um, question four was a sustainability question. If P and Case were to disappear, would those guys continue to behave like that? Not an un unreserved yes, that's a very difficult question to answer in a, in a yes or no, but there was reasonable evidence that um, those behavior changes had become part of their culture rather than being what P and Case said they had to do. Um, so a kind of hmm, possibly yes. And question five, is PNK good at, um, good at this outcome-based work? And the answer again was very strongly yes. They're very good at reflection. They ask why questions. They, they, um, they say, who's changed? Why did they change? What did we do? They're asking those kind of questions. They're appropriately training themselves. They've got a very flat team structure. structure. So great. Got yeses to pretty much all the questions, yeah? Um, and there's, there's a, a photo of, um, of the activities at, at one, one of the little project sites. And it's all about working with other people and, and doing, doing, doing cool, cool stuff with, with, other pe with other people in organizations and getting them to change. So the question, is P and Case doing things right? And the answer was undoubtedly yes. Um, but Michael and I promised you um, 30 million, um, 90 minutes of football. So what I have to do here is to pull up this. Um, I want you guys to have a look at this. This is a selective attention uh, test done by a, a football, a bunch of footballers in, in Britain who are worried about suicide and they were using football as an approach to reduce the, the, the suicide rates. But this is just about football. So have a look at this. Um, what you have to do, there's a team in white and a team in, in black, and you have to just focus on the white guys um, and count how many times they pass the ball to each other um, during about uh, 45 seconds. Um, and the pass means when it goes from one play to other, another. I also want you to say which, are the cool, which is the coolest move that the white guys, the, they hold it on their head and, and their knees and all sorts of stuff. 
So just focus and just do this. Ready? Okay, that's one. Keep going. Two. And how many passes did, did, did you count? The correct answer is 12. Um, and really, that, that shouldn't have been too hard. But carry on watching. Did you, um, if you haven't seen a video like this, when I use this, about 70% of people miss their ears. This is playing it backwards. The suicidal guy walked right, right through the middle of this game um, without, without anyone um, noticing. Or about 70% 70 of you um, may have, may have miss, missed that. Um, and there are other videos like that. If you've seen one like that before, obviously you, you, would, have, um, you would have spotted that. Um, it was a bit like this with the, with, the, with, the, um, with the evaluation. So we found all these great, great evaluation and P and cases work and the outcome mapping and the theory of change. And it was all working very nice and it was all hunky-dory. But one morning I said to my team, hey, they've organized a whole lot of interviews for us. I got the rest of the team to do the interviews. Guys, I'm just going to cruise out with some Nang Mai translator into the villages and go and have a, have a yarn to people. And I've met these three guys at, um, at nine in the morning, drink, sitting there drinking beer, and they're young blokes from the village, and they, they, um, <coughs> they um, have no, no friends left in the village. They, go, they drive, they drive a, uh, a truck around um, Cambodia delivering concrete to other villages to build concrete walls and concrete houses. Um, they've got no friends. They use, they use drug, drugs a bit. Um, they've got no aspirations for their life. I asked them in 10 years, what would you like to be doing? And they said, well, oh, driving trucks. And would it be your own truck? No, it'll, uh, we'll, we'll be driving for another owner. Um, and they were not unhappy. They had their beer in the morning and it was, it was all pretty, pretty reasonable. But they were totally disconnected from village life. And the next person I met was this, was this woman who hadn't given me permission to, so I've blanked out her face a little bit. But look at her mouth, she's really sad. And she told me she's just finished, she just left working, working in a, gar, uh, a garment factory where she was doing that 12 hour, hours a day work. She'd, she'd lost her job, whoops. Um, she'd lo lost, her, lost her job there. Um, her husband was still working in a construction site. Um, this is not a traditional village house anymore. This is a modern house with corrugated iron and there's beer cans in the, in the, in the background. And, um, she's also completely disconnected from, from her village and she's, um, she, she's really sad. And I, I asked her, I said, oh, you know, compared to your life when you grew up here um, and, and look, looking at it now, you said, yeah, sure, you've made a bit of money and you've, your husband's getting paid. Um, are you happy? Are you, is, how are things going? And she said, and she said oh, I'm totally unhappy, but I have no choice. That was a tragic comment. And the third... The third story, and I just got a whole day of stories like this. The third story, which I haven't got a photograph of, 15-year-old girl who was working in a garment factory. A truck comes at 4.30 in the morning and she gets picked up and goes and starts working at 6 a.m., goes across that awful bridge across the Mekong and dives into one of those factories and finishes at 6 p.m. and gets driven back and she's home by 8 p.m. and sleeps. And she had two old grandmothers who were really awful to her. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a doctor, or I was, I was in, a, in a previous life. Um, if I saw her as a, as, a, as a doctor, I'd say this, this was a young woman who's totally depressed and possibly suicidal. Um, and again, she felt she had no choice and this was, this was her life. And I had a whole morning of stories like this. Um, and that's, yeah, she's, she's gone into, into a factory like that. Um, so like some of you focused on, on the football action, you missed the man off to kill, him, kill his, um, himself focused on the excellent project activities in the now. Pen case had missed the Cambodian villages path over time. It's their trajectory and glo globalization breaking, in, breaking into the villages. Um, the context is on a trajectory and so, so, is, so is the project. So the question is, PNK is doing things right. We, we un undoubtedly said, yes, they are doing things right, but are they doing the right things? And there's a big question mark to that. Um, 
and it's food for thought. You know, it's their project is kind of like a good football, but it's on a not very good trajectory because more because of the context. The football's good. Pen cases work is good. If you take using our metaphor, if the project is the football, um, it's it's a it's a good it's a good um, it's a good project. It's a good football. Um, so let's think about trajectory and, and where where their sto story is going. So here's here's that theory of change that that they produced. This is what's really happening though. Um, there's a young guy. He's gone off to a construction site. She's gone off to a factory. Um, another young woman's joined her and another one. And someone else has gone to work in a brothel in Phnom Penh, and someone else maybe um, someone someone uh, someone else has um, migrated to Thailand. Um, someone else to the to the garment factory. She's gone and killed herself. Um, someone else has left. You know, this is what's ha this is really what this is. Whoops, that's really what's happening in in the villages. P and Case is doing great work, but for less and less people, they're becoming ir irrelevant. About. Um, when we did the numbers, about 80% of the people between 15 and 30 were outside of the village. So PNK's great community rural development work isn't really very relevant anymore. Um, and so that, you know, that, to, um, that definition of trajectory, the path over time of a project um, in its development space. And in this case, it's about the development space. The development space is on a traje um, trajectory. And relative to the development space, PNKS, despite its great work, is becoming increasing, increasingly irrelevant. Um, and like we said, it's a time to redraw our boundary, figure out what, how today's wor world re really is, who's in and who's out, and redraw ourselves. And they're gonna do that. Um, and I hope they're gonna ask me to, to come back in a, in a month or two and help them with that, because I find it incredibly interesting. Um, there's a link to the to the whole. Um, the top ones are linked to the um, evaluation report. It's on my it's on my website, which is if you go to un un unpredictable.co. It's not com. It's it's .co. Um, press the learn tab, and then you'll find a thing to a link to the PNK evaluation. This is just out of the the um, um, executive summary at, at at the beginning. And just look at the look at this stuff in bold. Our major finding is that huge rapid changes in the social, political, environmental context in which or P in case work is nested, mean that many people live outside the ambit of VDA, C CDA, CCVL, and SSC. Um, and that was, that was the key thing. Um, and that translates really as saying, our major finding is the context is on a trajectory, um, time is of the F essence, and we're getting left behind. Okay. Um, Michael, did you want to say anything in between or shall I go straight on to the second story? Um, are you guys still there? There, I, I was trying to unmute, sorry. Um, um, I was muted. Did you want to say anything else, Michael, or shall I just go on to the second story? Let me, let me just add one, one piece um, from the other side of the world. Your story really resonates, and I appreciate um, your, your sharing it. There's a major um, study that, that came out in the United States last year that was done by Angus Deaton, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2015. And his wife, both at Princeton, social scientist, um, studying suicide in the United States. And the major finding, which was considered quite shocking, was a significant increase in the suicide rate among um, low-income, poorly educated white males. Um, they now have a higher su suicide rate than any other subgroup in the population, middle-aged, low-income, poorly educated white males. And in their analysis of the, um, the reasons, is they find that these are the main victims of globalization because the jobs that they had have all been moved to the very places where you were working. Um, and so the juggernaut of globalization, as you describe it, is having its effects um, 
on all sides of the world uh, as uh, the the local context is very much affected by these global contexts over time the the current um, younger generation in the United States is the first in American history. When you talk about trajectory, the first in American history that doesn't expect their life to be better than their parents. Um, and that's a, that's a huge shift in terms of where people think that they're going, given partly global warming, the Anthropocene, globalization, changes in the world. Um, you've picked up on it beautifully from from uh, your part of the world, it's going on in in the other parts of the world. Um, the one other thing I wanted to mention, Jeff, um, is the um, your reference to outcome mapping and outcome harvesting. Um, Ricardo Wilson Grau, a good friend who um, who just uh, published a book on outcome harvesting um, uh, that came out at the end of last year. Um, Ricardo um, unfortunately died in, um, in January, and um, uh, we're very sorry to have lost him. His outcome harvesting is a, is a great contribution and very much sensitive to the kind of trajectory work that, that, um, that you're describing. Um, so thank you for the story and for the, the football analogies, and I'll, um, I'll turn it back to you. Thank, uh, thanks, Michael. And um, don't worry, guys, we've got, we've got more, more football to come. Um, but before that, we've, we've got a little, little story. It happens also to be in Cambodia. <coughs> Nothing special about Cambodia, just, just by coincidence. Um, this little remote northern corner of Cambodia, kind of forgotten, forgotten place. It's, all, it's still jungle. There's still tigers there. Um, somehow got missed by in, the, in the terrible Pol Pot years and, and the Vietnam War, etc. Um, just... Just, just out of the way. It's a kind of place I love. Um, it was such a privilege to go and uh, evaluate there. Um, and oops, what's going on here? Um, what are we doing? Um, why is that not playing? Um, okay, uh, we're away now. That uh, red star up in northern India. That's that's where I live. Um, a little bit further north than that, where I'm right now, looking at those mountains. Um, so where's this trajectory going? So a place where there's isolated indigenous groups, uh, kind of family groups or clans really, um, live by hunt, hunting and gathering, a little bit of uh, Sweden, Sweden agriculture. They don't do sedentary agriculture, formal schools, politics, nation states, land titles, current, currency ba based trade, uh, war or any, of, or any of the other trappings of modern civilizations. Um, and suddenly, they would avalanched, and the last 20 years, they've been totally avalanched by modernity and, and globalization. Roads were built, and then it all came. Um, and I'll tell you the story shortly. Um, so where is this trajectory? This is a road to, road to globalization, really. Um, and you see it happen in the last 20 years. That's the first road as, as, um, as it was built. That's about 15 years ago. That's what it looked like. But it didn't take long for, that's a truck taking uh, tropical hardwood logs out of the, out of the place. Um, the Bunong people, the, the original in inhabitants of this area, are spiritually connected to the forest. You cut trees down there and you're cutting their soul. Um, and there's the final, uh, the final piece in the, in, the, in, the, in the trajectory. And guys, I think every single person uh, listening to this webinar, we're in that last picture at the top. That's a world that where we've all come from this, this previous world. It's taken longer for us, but we've ended up in places where there's parking lots full of, full of cars. It's just, it was so stark here because it's happened in, in 20 years from a kind of a paleolithic lifestyle to a, the, um, the modern world. And we defined um, trajectory as, as the um, movement of, of a project over time in its development space. Um, and remembering that this is this Bunong woman, um, at least her parents would have been felt spiritually connected to the forest. Now there's no forest around her, around her house. There's bits of tropical hardwood, which is one may see pieces of her soul. The box is, is Uncle, which is a, a beer, a brand of beer. Um, the kids are likely to be sniffing glue and a little bit kind of dissolute. This is this is the trajectory. That's where that road that road's going. And I don't know how many of you recognise what this thing is. Um, what it is, it's a cashew nut. 
Um, so when you're sitting on an aeroplane and quietly sipping your, sipping your beer and eating cashew nuts, this is where it comes from. It comes from rampant deforestation, deforestation and places like this and cashew, cashew plantations and people pushed off land and all sorts of things. I can't eat cashew nuts after, after this. Um, and it's kind of a phase change, as I said before. Paleolithic lifestyle, here's a guy weaving a basket or, his, or a woman uh, using a basket in, in a rich, diverse forest where he may gather one of you know, several hundred um, uh, products of the forest or he may go hunting, he may, may do other things. But his children, his children, they're gonna be wage workers and this, this is what happens to that land when they deforest it, a rubber plantation. They'll be working nine to five jobs on below minimum income and um, in a in a in a monoculture that's made made for the Western globalized um, neoliberal world that we all live in. And here it is said so poignantly by um, a picture, a child's picture. Around my house, I have trees, different kinds of fruit to eat, a well and a table. Now there are lots of tractors and different machinery in my village. I don't know where they come from. And it hurts your soul, doesn't it? That con I don't know where they come from. The world is unfolding and he's got no control. He doesn't know. Life's just happening to him. He's not in control of it. Diagrammatically, here it is here. Indigenous communities, um, they were on their own, their own development trajectory. They, they, were, they were, you know, devel developing as, well, as a... And then suddenly those, the Cambodian government um, came and imposed um, culturally inappropriate education on, on all the kids. They have to learn Khmer and they have to learn to read and write and they don't learn the jungle law and they don't learn any of these other things. And the organization that I went with, they started off doing this, RIDE was an acronym, I can't quite remember what it's for, but the E is for education. They were doing indig indigenous literacy and, um, and making, making books. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't just that, there was all this other stuff happening, roads, deforestation, alcohol and drugs, violence, violence in communities and between communities, the illegal loggers come along and they shoot indigenous people um, to get the tropical hardwood around their villages. Plantations, land titles, dams, you know, the whole thing. We've, we've heard the story before. Um, and here's, here's the trajectory. Here's the, here's the, here's the, the push. This is, this is Maradona's handball. He's pushing, he's pushing it. And the, it, there, it, there it goes, down there towards cultural annihilation. Um, this is the Bunong, the Bunong culture is on the edge and they're just about there. They're almost annihil annihilated as a, as a culture. Um, there's people sniffing glue, glue or working in brothels in town. There's people, there's family groups broken up. There's, but there's not Bunong culture, is it? Um, or almost isn't any Bunong culture as, as, as it was. And the NGO that I was working with, um, they realized that saving language and building literacy can't stop that cultural annihilation. But the question is, what can? And just a couple of pictures of, of what that what that looks like. Here's a here's a traditional uh, traditional feast, and this is people with products from the jungle and cooking it the traditional way. And that turns into something like this, um, you know, people hassling and, and jostling to sell and buy products in the market. There's cars in the background, and what on earth? There's bottled water in the foreground. This is one of the places on earth with the heaviest rainfall there is, and there's plastic bottles full of water so that you can drink it. That's globalization for you. Now this NGO was totally aware of the context moving and they were moving with their context. So in 1997, they were doing that indigenous language and literacy. With, um, um, by 2001, they said, look, there's other areas here, there's other, and all these little indigenous groups have a different language because they haven't had connection um, previously. They haven't been connected to each other. So there's other little family groups doing Sweden agriculture somewhere else who speak a different language and aren't, aren't connected. So they expanded their area. Um, by 2006, they'd started doing some community development work. And by 2013, um, they'd become IBCD, which stands for um, Identity Based Community Development and, uh, and Education. And it's a very interesting um, uh, title for an NGO, Identity Based. They're working with the identity of the people. Fantastic organization, 68 people, 66, 65 of them were, were indigenous themselves. Um, and they, spoke, they worked with lots of, lots of um, different language groups. They spoke lots of languages. Um, they were really embedded in, in the changes happening. Um, and so there it is, there's a trajectory of the NGO. It's, it's actually moving as the context is, 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 is um, moving. And they realized that this enforced uh, 
transition, I don't know where they come from, comment of the child, that's stripping dignity. And they said, we can't stop this avalanche of, of um, modernity, but we can dream of a dignified adaptation to it. People um, keeping their identity, moving into modernity, but keeping an indigenous identity in, in modernity. Um, and there, again, just some, some pictures of, if, we don't, if they don't do this, they've got this impressive um, Bunong woman on the left in her traditional dress, and on the right you have probably what this is in, in her village, what, what might happen, and she might end up buying uh, Colgate Slim Soft uh, toothpaste, and in a few more years she'll have high heels and a mini skirt and be walking down a supermarket aisle behind a shopping trolley. That's, that's the kind of trajectory that we're talking about. Um, so diagrammatically, this is, this is what um, they say. That our indigenous communities are almost at cultural annihilation. Um, we've moved a bit, but we need to reform ourselves. And this comment here, let's lie, write a different story. How the heck would you do that? Um, let's take away that arrow pointing down towards uh, cultural annihilation. And let's see if we can find an emergent pathway. And it will be wiggly and it will be, um, and I, I specifically drew this to be like a kind of pathway through the jungle um, which the Bunong people are obviously very good at. Um, and could we possibly um, have identity pr uh, preserving adaptation? So that's our dream. And we don't know how to follow that pathway, but let's see if we can, we can find a way. And so my job was to evaluate these things, dignity and mindset. They had this idea of how do people think? And those are pretty fluffy things to evaluate. I loved it, by the way. I think those are the those are the essence that's um, evaluating that kind of stuff is a whole lot more interesting than being asked how many, how many children have been immunized or this is, this is lovely. And of course I, I did it. I did it by outcome harvesting, spent three weeks there and just a few pictures. This is, this is the kind of stuff that really does it for me. Um, traveling on rafts across big rivers and talking to people in villages and um, listening to women tell tell these stories. And yeah, this is, this was fantastic. This is, this is what I live for. Um, And here's a picture. Um, here's a picture of dignified adaptation. Um, these guys are indigenous guys, and that big pot in the middle is actually of the kind of indigenous homebrew. But what they're doing here, this is fantastic. What they're doing, they formed a forest patrol. It's illegal. The Cambodian law says it's illegal to cut the wood. People do it, and there's all sorts of bribes paid. And tropical hardwood is, is incredibly valuable. And the guys have chainsaws and uh, automatic uh, rifles. Um, and they'll, 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 sh they'll shoot people who try to stop them. Um, the indigenous guys, however, have much better knowledge of the forest than any of the other guys. The NGOs help them with a little bit of GIS. Um, so they can, they can tra track in, um, illegal loggers. Um, they creep up on them barefoot and do citizens' arrests, take their chainsaws and, and their um, automatic weapons off them and tie them up and take them to the police. And that, if anything, is dignified adaptation, isn't it? They say, look, this is our soul you're cutting here. This is our soul. And there's no way you're going to do this. And we're going to take you to the police. And they've linked them up to the World Wildlife Fund and to uh, legal approaches to, to get this stopped. It's not totally stopped. But the fact that people can organize their own forest patrol and do that, that's dignified adaptation. Um, and so the question is, how do we how, how to continue this, this trajectory, which this NGO, unlike PNKS, these guys had actually moved it as the context had moved. And so some of the stuff was just starting. Um, and the question was, how, um, how do we continue this tra trajectory? And possibly the most challenging evaluation present presentation, one of the most challenging things I've had to do in my life, after three weeks, to present to six different indigenous language groups, um, to people from UNDP, to government ministers, to police, to the whole NGO team, to an interna two international evaluators, I had to present these findings um, over a whole day in an indigenous meeting house. And the answer when you get something like that, how the heck, heck do you do that? Get people to tell their stories. So here's a group of, this is in, in the evaluation presentation, um, Bunong people doing a role play, and they're actually showing, and there's a guy from the dam company there, and they did this incredibly um, evocative, demonstration of, of, of their village getting flooded by, by a dam. It was brilliant. And the dam guy was there and the government minister was there and you think, wow, these guys are all in the same room and they see shirtless indigenous people doing a role play of what, of what development means to them. Fantastic. Um, one of the most stimulating things I've, I've ever done. Um, so the question, you know, how to, how to, how to continue the, uh, this trajectory. And 
stick that in, in, your, pi in your pipe and smoke it. Um, the question, how to change this story to, and I promised you some football, and unfortunately, I don't know if this is going to play, but I'm going to, I'm going to find, I don't think it is going to play, but I'm going to find it on, on the net and play it for you. This is, this is the five minutes later what Diego Maradona did. Um, let's see if we can find this. Hopefully, I can find this clip of Maradona's goal of the century. Let's see. Um, and this is a piece of genius, and this is, listen to the commentary, and I'll try to translate it for you as we go. This happened five minutes. Oh, whoops. Sorry about this. I'm I'm doing I'm doing this off a off a phone hotspot, so it's struggling with the This is one of the great commentaries. This is poetry, but listen to this commentary. Oh yeah, look at this. Go. I want to cry. My God. Football lives. That's a goal. That's a fantastic goal. Diego. What a goal. You have to cry at this. An incredible run. The play of all time. A, a comet from outer space. From what planet did you come from? He's just left all the English behind him. And the whole, the whole, the whole country is a, is a clenched fist shouting Maradona. And that'll do for that. Um, I just want to go back to my PowerPoint. Where are we? Okay. Um, the whole country with a clenched fist shouting, shouting for Maradona. Tell me that that goal had, not, had not, nothing to do with the, with the, with the, with the uh, Falklands War. Um, and so I've kept in contact. I actually spoke to Sir Paul uh, two days ago, who's from this organization. What happened? How did this trajectory carry on? Um, and we said at the evaluation, they needed to get a, a bigger network. They needed to, this story has happened to indigenous people all over the, all over the world. First people in Canada and Australia and New Zealand. And, and the only way that it, it can, you can avoid it is actually to, um, for indigenous people to get into the modern world and um, do it on their own terms dignified, um, take on the modern world in a dignified way. Um, so they formed the Bunong Community Network and they do all sorts of, of um, fantastic things. They, they, indigenous groups of different language groups go and help each other and go and work with, with, with other groups. So they've started going across their traditional boundaries and they're forming uh, groups of indigenous people. They work with legal issues. They help each other on forestry issues. Um, they've got into politics. Um, they've got six people elected, including a woman elected to the uh, regional parliament. Um, they've got into land titling. They've got um, the uh, they, they've got the, um, they've got World Wildlife Fund and legal aid, and they get um, you know the land's just been taken away from them, land that was always there. But now they're saying, actually, this is our land, and we're going to get a title to it. They're fighting it. They're fi fighting on their own terms. They've done forest protection again with a coalition of other big uh, NGOs. They've got into education. Um, Indigenous languages and literacy is now part of, um, of the education system agreed by the Cambodian government um, to the schools in the area. Um, they've got a legal representative. They fight on many, on many uh, uh, legal grounds. They've got ecotourism. They've got agriculture, um, different kinds of agriculture. They do sustainable forest products rather than, rather than just um, clear filling the, the forest and growing cashew nuts for 20 years and then leave, leaving the land. Um, and that thing you just heard in, in, that, um, in that commentary on Maradona's goal, ta, 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 each one of those was a step of brilliance of Maradona. Take each one of these things that they're doing, it's a ta, 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 ta. This is a trajectory of, 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 a, of a, just a fantastic thing happening. They're designing a new, new trajectory. And quiero llorar. I want to cry when I, when, I, when I hear this stuff. It's changing, it's changing reality. I love it, love it. 
So that's that's the second Thank story. You. And I've just I'll just finish. I've got two more slides. Trajectory is the path over time of a project in its development space, and trajectories can change. And there's a story of when it did. And here's my last slide. How do we contribute? And Michael said this about uh, globalization having its victims in the in the West as well as in developing countries. How do we contribute to changing the trajectory of humanity in the spherical development space in which we live? Um, and that's me. I'm done. Thank you, Jeff. That's that's tremendous. Let me ask you to stop sharing your screen. I'm going to pull mine back up. Um, how do I do the stop share? Uh, at the top, there should be um, some place where you can stop sharing. I've got I've got a thing that says new new share. Do I? Oh, pause share. I'll try that. Has that worked? Uh, there we go. Stop share. There we go. There we go. All right. And I've got your your screen up in front of me. There we go. Excellent. That was tremendous. Thank you for um, those tremendous examples for the language. Um, certainly dignified adaptation. I love that that phrase. Um, and um, one of the one of the times issues that emerges in the, the the chapter and in our world is running out of time. The uh, the doomsday clock last year got moved ahead 30 seconds. We're at two minutes till midnight on the uh, the dangers to the world from nuclear proliferation, and uh, we're dealing with um, with uh, folks that that aren't paying enough attention uh, on all these things. So. Uh, thank you for your, your contribution. We're going to open it up now. If anybody has a question or a comment, we've got a, a few minutes. Um, or, Jeff, you're, you can unmute yourself or put something in the chat box um, if you've got a question or, or comment for, for Jeff. Hey Jeff, this is Glenn. Um, excellent, excellent presentation. Um, just, it, it really made me think, um, how do you think applying some of the blue marble principles that are in development now and that will soon to be coming out, how do you think it's going to change your work as you engage um, across many different local areas, but connecting it to global issues? How do you think the blue marble perspective and principles will affect how you do what you do? Oh, thank you. thanks, Glenn. Um, you know, when Michael, I first got onto this blue marble stuff when uh, Michael presented it at an um, AEA meeting, um, and he was talking about something else, actually. He was talking about, um, but he just flicked onto blue marble, and it totally just hit a button inside me. And I think one of the reasons... Uh, and I said this to Michael the other day, uh, this is about who I am right? rather than, it's, it's also about what I do and how I work, et cetera, about who I am. Probably the biggest thing that Blue Marble is going to do for me, um, Glenn, is it's going to connect, connect me to a community of other people who think this way. Um, when, you know, you look at the, the Blue Marble principles, uh, you know, I look at them and I think, yeah, yeah, of course, um, that, that is what I, I've tried to do. But it's so, it's so, so, um, I don't think in terms of me personally, there's that much that's going to change. But the thing that really excites me and invigorates me is saying, I can be connected to a whole lot of other people who, who think in similar ways. I'll, I'll, I'll qualify that, actually. I think um, this idea of zooming in and zooming out, I think I'm going to do that a whole lot more. Zoom out. The, the kind of thing that, that Michael just said, you know, you look at textile, uh, textile switch shops in, in Southeast Asia, and then I'll, actually I'm going to zoom right out and say, well, what happens in, in the places these textiles go to? Um, and ask those kind of questions, um, and really, um, and also the cross silo principle. You know, rather than anything just being just an ecological project or just a um, health project or something, um, just moving, moving, moving across the silos. I'll just be more deliberate about about doing that. But most of all, I'm just invigorated by being part of a community um, who all who all think and understand things this way. <laughs> We um, you zooming in and zooming out comment, Jeff, reminds me um, 
of a different football connection, American football um, connection. You know, we just had our our um, big uh, American Super Bowl event um, in American football, and the owner of the winning team, one of the richest men in America, um, was just arrested in a brothel in Florida, and it has unveiled a international sex trafficking scheme that uh, this place in Florida and one of the sites is actually in Minnesota that involves thousands of young women, many of them from the very parts of the world you were talking about. And one of the examples you gave is a village woman going off to a brothel and they're uncovering this extensive global network from Eastern Europe, from all over Asia, um, of uh, transporting young women into uh, what amounts to slavery, um, and having arrested the major owner of the biggest fr football franchise in, um, in America has exposed this worldwide trafficking network. Yeah, it's just, you know, the whole world, there's just connections everywhere. And, you know, there's causes here and consequences there. And they're all, they're all connected. It's, you know, it's so much about connections, isn't it? Anyone else have a question or comment before we, um, we wrap up? Well, thank you again, Jeff. I know you went to some trouble to find a spot that you could uh, um, offer this. Uh, I found it tremendously informative and uh, very creative. Appreciate the, the very different ways in which you uh, gave us a sense of, of your work. It's fantastic to learn what you are up to. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you as part of this emerging Blue Marble community. Um, thank thank you, thanks Mike. to Glenn and Charlene um, for taking care of the infrastructure and for all of those of you who joined us at different times uh, around the world. Have a great day, Jeff. We'll be going to bed on this part of the world. Yeah, I've got a day ahead of me. Just before we go, um, it's on. It's on there. There's a link. Um, the P and K's evaluation report. If you want to, if you want to read read it it's it's Great. there it's on my website unfortunately the other one about the um indigenous people the organization um asked uh, please don't share it so that one's not available thank you so much i love i love doing this well you do a great to have you back for some more this is not the end by any means uh good night good day uh, wherever you happen to be and um uh we'll be continuing to engage thank you all very much good night see ya Good night.